I'm Suzanne Akbari, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on textiles and manuscripts. The workshop has been organized by members of the Book and the Silk Roads Research Project, which is generously supported by the Mellon Foundation. Since we're reading virtually rather than in person, each of us is in a different location. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Lenape people or Lenapoking. Lenape people today include the Delaware Tribe and Delaware Nation in what is now Oklahoma, the Muncie Mohican Band in what is now Wisconsin, and the Muncie Delaware Nation in what is now Ontario in Canada. Other local communities continue to exist on Lenapoking, including the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape, the Powhatan Lenape, and the Ramapo Lenape Nations. For those of you in North America on Turtle Island, I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to find out whose land you live on and to learn more about it, especially the very local aspects of the land you're on. While the Book and the Silk Roads project is based at the University of Toronto, today's workshop is hosted by the Institute for Advanced Study in recognition of the current censure of the University of Toronto by the Canadian Association of University Teachers. We hope for a speedy resolution to the issues pertaining to academic freedom that are addressed by the censure, and we're grateful to the participants and to all of you today for your patience as we move the original date and change the host of the workshop. I'd also like to express gratitude to those at IAS who have been working hard behind the scenes to put this event together, particularly the gorgeous videos that you will have seen on the project, um, our workshop project website, and the link for that is um, in the chat in case you need it. These include Maria Mercedes Tuya, who also is facilitating today's Zoom meeting, and Dario Mastriani, who edited the videos. And I'd particularly like to recognize Dr. Melissa Morton, who is the Book and the Silk Roads project manager for this workshop, and as of yesterday, has just officially joined the Institute for Advanced Study as a research associate. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jessica Lockhart, head of research for the Book and the Silk Roads team, who's kept us all organized throughout the workshop preparation. Finally, let me just give a very brief roadmap for the day and offer a few housekeeping announcements before I introduce our first speaker. We'll begin with two introductory talks, one by the Silk, Book in the Silk Road's lead PI, Alex Gillespie, um, and one by Melissa Morton to lay out the aims of the workshop and give a sense of its structure and guiding principles. We'll then move at 11 a.m. Eastern time to the first session on Syriac manuscripts. Then we'll have a half hour break with two more sessions in the second half of today. And tomorrow will be more um, delights, more feast. Let me mention a couple of housekeeping issues and I'll remind you of these later on as well. The same Zoom link you have today will work for both days of the workshop. And we've put the workshop's webpage just now in the chat so you can see the program if you don't already have it at hand. The embedded videos, which you will probably already have watched if you haven't watched them tonight, um, they're on that site. And the co-discussants for each session are listed in alphabetical order. In each session, the co-discussants will talk about questions that arise from the pre-recorded videos in conversation with a moderator who brings a new perspective to the material. After their discussion for about 30 minutes, we'll move to audience questions and discussion for the second half of each session. Please use the chat function addressed to panelists and attendees. Don't just do panelists, but do panelists and attendees, there's a drop down, um, so that everyone can see them. And that way, questions will often be complementary to one another rather than repeating the same um, thought. You can add questions at any time during the conversation, and uh, we'll be um, uh, using an internal moderator to sort of feed these questions in to make sure the discussion proceeds smoothly online. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexandra Gillespie, who will offer our first presentation. She's Professor of English and Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto, and her research focuses on medieval and early modern texts and books, the de global development of early book technologies, and digital and non-destructive scientific approaches to the study of pre-modern books. Her most recent publication, co-edited with Deirdre Lynch, is The Unfinished Book, a collection of essays on the state of protocology and its many future possibilities. The Unfinished Book was published by Oxford University Press in February 2021, so just a few months ago. And in her free time, Alex serves as one of the University of Toronto's vice presidents and is principal of the University of Toronto at Mississauga. And in her free time after that, she searches for fungi and shepherds those, um, those wild children. So please join me in welcoming Alex Gillespie. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And um, if everybody could, um, everyone else besides Alex could turn their, all the panelists could turn their video off, that will, that will help us. I'm going to share a screen now uh, as well. Um, I hope folks can see that. Can I get confirmation that that is seen? Yes, we can see Thank it. Thank you so much. Just playing. Okay. Um, so, Buju, 
Alexandra Gillespie, Nadish Nikos, as you just heard. Um, I greet you today from a room of Lylehurst, which um, is the principal's residence at the University of Toronto Mississauga, where, as you just heard, I am principal and have the privilege to live. The window looks out over Missinihi, the river that the French and British called the Credit, because at its mouth, at Port Credit, they traded with Indigenous peoples who for thousands of years had travelled and stewarded its waters and the land around it. I'm on the traditional lands of the Wenda and the Seneca in a house by the waters and on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I acknowledge this and the guidance of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the friendship they show to me as a leader here at UTM uh, and to all in our wider U of T community and with those we work with locally, provincially and internationally as we seek to live a good life. Tima Gwach. In addition to recognizing the land and role of ind indigenous people, peoples, I wish to acknowledge a great loss that sees all the flags on our university's campus and across Canada lowered. Last Thursday, we learned with grief that the remains of 215 Indigenous children had been discovered on the grounds of Canada's Kamloops Indian Residential School. On this Monday, just past, the Anishinaabe leader from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Honourable Harry Laforme, pointed me and, and a small group of others to the words that the poet Kahili Gibran uses to describe children. Quote, they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Each of the children who died at Kamloops Residential School was one of the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. And we mourn them and we commit to listening to the truth about the past that must come before any reconciliation over injustice, to true reciprocity with diverse peoples, to principles of academic freedom, human rights, and the admission of marginalized and excluded voices into our conversations that lie behind the censure that Suzanne referred to and that led us to postpone and relocate this event. I especially commit to being good kin to local nations and all the indigenous people we learn with and from at our campus here in Mississauga, at U of T, throughout Turtle Island and around the world. I also need to acknowledge the epic efforts of our organizers, already mentioned uh, Melissa Morton and Jessica Lockhart, but let me also mention the epic efforts of the participants who not only had to be patient with our change of location and change of timing, but also worked tirelessly to produce those beautiful videos or to get ready to talk about those. We're so grateful to them. I want to acknowledge that this research um, that we present here today was accomplished, accomplished largely, not entirely, but to a, to a very great extent, without access to libraries and resources of the sort we normally all take for granted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the one hand, this is a moment to recognize um, the losses of and, and the grief of the past um, year and a bit since the pandemic began. On the other hand, um, I, I always hesitate to suggest there's any silver lining to this pandemic, which it seems to me is that that's not a fair way to represent it. But there have been things we've learned during it. And one of the things we've learned is that there's a certain kind of international collaboration possible, even when you work with material objects like books, um, and that enormous amounts of fruitful work um, and collaboration can get done virtually. We have found new ways to meet as a community across time, distance, and I think we've discovered the extraordinary importance of this sustaining web of connections. So thank you for being part of that web today to everybody who is participating. As, whether they're as audience or as formal participants. Today, I'm gonna to speak about the frame and context for this workshop on textiles and manuscripts. As you've heard with my colleague, Suzanne Akbari um, uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and with Sean Meikle, Director of IT at University Libraries. With extremely generous funding from the Mellon Foundation, we're running a project called The Book and the Silk Roads. We use that um, these days pretty familiar plural silk roads rather than road because the routes that move traded goods, including silk, and also people and ideas between East and West, if you want to use those orientations, in the pre-modern period. Um, and here's a map showing um, East and West with the sea routes marked in blue and the land routes marked in red. These routes were never singular, um, never uh, as singular as they look even here on this map nor as the term Silk Road makes them sound. Here's a map that begins to show some of the complexity of the intricate network of roads used by traders in what is usually considered the earliest period um, of the Silk Roads, um, 300 BCE to 100 CE. 
So that's an explanation of Silk Roads. I'm also using the word book. We will be using the word book um, in, uh, uh, in my presentation today um, to describe a what, and of course the word manuscript as we proceed to describe a wide range of um, portable um, and non-portable text and image bearing ob objects produced in locations around the, around the globe. In our project, the book and the Silk Roads, books can be rolls, leaves, screen folds, tablets. Um, we're even interested in standing stones, like the ones archiving these petroglyphs at the Kinamage Wakong of the Curve Lake uh, Nation here in Ontario in Canada. In modern English, the word book is sometimes used exclusively to mean printed books in codex form. If you look up the OED, you'll find that as one of its dominant meanings. But the word, of course, has a much richer history of describing objects that contain texts. Old English, bok, book, and bet, beach, are probably cognate. And the link between the words suggests an intimate connection between texts and the bark and wood that were used as surfaces for early writing. There are similar connections with the material made in other languages from the same period of history. Sanskrit virja um, in, mass, in the masculine means birch tree. In its feminine form, it means birch bark used as writing. Poti is from Sanskrit pustika, book, which is probably related to Persian pust, skin or hide. The word book itself, that is, gives us some sense of how books record human interactions with the natural world, as well as with each other over time. It is in the writing, uh, not just the writing, but also the making, the material um, composition of books that we posit the story of the book and the Silk Roads um, begins and can be told. A book is a folded object. It's also very often one that we could describe as stitched or sewn or thread or woven. There's a wonderful account from the 11th century author Wang Zhu from Song Dynasty era, era Ying Shan, now the Henan province in China. He writes, quote, in making books, if the leaves are pasted, after a while they escape and get in a muddle. You have to take care not to lose leaves and to recreate the page sequence in order to recopy the work. A method of restoring such works is to stitch them, which makes them more durable. I had several volumes of the Dong family's text with the pages disordered and upside down after years of reading. I was exhausted by the effort of guessing at the original order and gradually linked all the pages together to have them stitched. It's often noted, um, for example, it, it used to be the starting point of, um, of the paleography classes I used to teach for, teach for Western European manuscripts before I became a full-time administrator. I would often note that the word text from the Latin te texo to weave catches something of the woven appearance of handwritten cursical, cursible Gothic script. But there's another way to consider that idea of weaving in the book. Books themselves are a kind of textile technology made by folding and knitting together leaves of bark or wood or papyrus or paper or parchment, skin or palm leaves, not always, but often. In textile, sometimes they're rolls, although sometimes those are, are sewn together too. Textile crafts and textiles themselves, especially, um, but not only silk were among the key skills and goods that moved along and gave their name to the silk roots. And so books have that kind of belonging there too. So today's workshop is framed, um, if I dare the pun, if it's a pun, perhaps woven into um, this project, the book and the silk roads, where silk roads refer to real visible, visitable spaces and tangible histories to books and the materials, skins, inks, pigments, paper and textiles that can be located in those particular spaces and those specific histories. But the book in the Silk Roads is also a way for us to think about histories of transnational cultural exchange and convergent evolution um, across a broad human history and over the long durée of human history, even beyond the geographical zone that we call the Silk Roads. It, it gives us a way to think about how those histories um, can frame our understanding of the development of the technology of books and all those aspects of human culture that go along with them. In all of this, um, what we hope to do is promote a way of thinking about the book as a vibrant archive, one that bears texts and art and stories, but also bears traces of humans' interactions with one another and human beings' interactions with the natural world. Now, here comes the part where I admit that in this company, on this topic, I am a bit of an imposter. This is not just a feeling, imposter syndrome is actually a fact. 
Um, I was trained in the 1990s and early 2000s in medieval English literature. Um, sometimes I'd look at something French or something in Middle Scots, um, and it's true there was a fair bit of Latin in there, but it was mostly uh, the, the English poet Geoffrey Chaucer and, uh, and Chaucerian authors, authors imitating him. And this, rather than, for example, Silk Roads or Eurasian or even transnational studies, or even strictly speaking, code ecology or the study of the physical book or the study of um, bound books as a kind of textile technology. This is my background, not all those things. But my literary studies did lead me early on and more and more as my career developed to an interest in the constituent materials and the three-dimensional handcrafted shape of medieval books. Because books are obviously great. I think I hope everyone who's here already agrees on that point. We don't have to argue it. Books are amazing. But also because the writer, Chaucer, I was working on in, in that early part of my career is so interested in them. So I'm going to try not to digress too much about Chaucer. But I do want to just track a little bit how my own interests in books have landed me here, introducing this extraordinary event today and tomorrow. In his Canterbury Tales, um, Chaucer's narrator reminds the reader that they are reading a book. They can, quote, turn the leaf and cheese another tale, choose another tale, if they don't like the one in front of them. And yet the whole of the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer's most famous work, are set in a fictional frame of a pilgrimage to Canterbury. And, and I should say the date of this text, um, for those of you who don't know, is about, about 1400. This pilgrimage is a way to collect up tales from within a broad culture of oral delivery and hand copying, where texts, um, stories circulated in myriad forms in late medieval England to make sure they don't, to quote Wang Zhu again, quote, escape and get in a muddle. Um, the, um, the pilgrimage framework traps a bunch of people people in a pilgrimage listening to a group of stories in order and together. Except that if you, and those of you who know the tales will know this, it actually doesn't always quite work. Sometimes pilgrims, new pilgrims ride up and inter interrupt the pilgrimage with their story. In other cases, pilgrims get angry with one another um, and interrupt one another. So it seems to me Chaucer offers, among other things in his Canterbury Tales, a way to um, understand the order and disorder of the book that he's always reminding his readers is actually the thing, not a pilgrimage. No one's on a horse when they're reading the Canterbury Tales anymore, or probably ever was. Rather, they're holding a book. And the tales are a way to understand the order and disorder of the book, the way that books keep texts close, keep them, keep them together, um, unmuddle them, um, to, to refer back to our Chinese author, but also move them around. They preserve them, but they also open them to change. And what I found early in my career was that um, all this made much more sense if I admitted the evidence of the books of Chaucer's own era to my mode of thinking about this, just as Chaucer likely did. Take this book. It's a late 15th century vernacular miscellany that includes two Canterbury tales, uh, Chaucer's Mallaby and Parsons tale. This is its limp parchment binding. It's its earliest binding. Um, it's covered in wax stains. There's a black ring from where someone put an ink pot down on it. And what you can see on the spine there, and I'll show you a close up, um, is the way it was tied together um, with tackets. Tackets, as some of you will know, could be, I mean, is a term that we use sometimes to describe thread or cord loops. But in this case, they are wetted and twisted strips of parchment. And the 12 choirs that made up this book were so stitched, were sewn into eight separate units or book or booklets using thread. The tackets were then wound around the main sewing stations for each of the booklets and through the limp parchment cover where they were knotted onto a stiff reinforcing strip of tanned and stamped hide. In the Western European manuscript tradition, tackets like these were routinely used by late medieval copyists to hold leaves, choirs, or booklets together to prevent that muddle, either in, in anticipation of the binder's craft or as an abbreviation of it. It was faster and simpler to tack it than to sew choirs onto supports and then lace those into the cover. But tacketing also allowed book producers to forestall the decisions about final codicological form, even after a book was bound. The sequence of items in this manuscript could be changed. A tacket could be unknotted, pulled out, and a tacketed choir or booklet removed, replaced, or reattached elsewhere. And if you look very closely, and I, I imagine the image here is, is not quite going to allow this, so you have to trust me, there's a row of tackets using stitching holes in the spine, um, using, un there's a row of unused tacket holes in the spine. Um, these match up to similar holes in the spine folds of the choirs and what they suggest is a process of making and unmaking this bound structure of this book, of, um, of pulling out some leaves um, and moving them around, putting them back in or, or leaving them out completely. 
It's thus a way to understand that a book could be more than one thing at once, a collection of separate items as well as a whole made out of them, a way to think about the aesthetic and a reflection on the bookish culture that we find in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, for example. So this was my first turning point, realizing that something is just distantly removed from Chaucer's literary work as the tackets and threads used to tie manuscripts of that very text together could tell me something about Chaucer's thinking and the textual imaginary of his moment, how that worked, and that was transformative. I discovered what many of our speakers today, of course, knew from the start, that there was so much to learn from the closest physical examination of a book, not just um, its text or the images it bore, but the evidence of its gutters and foreages, of its gathered and attached forms from the, of the skins and the textiles within it. So I began to look at books in these terms, not as an expert, but as someone eager to learn. Um, and eager to learn from those who knew more. I'll offer just one more example, again, of how I end up here from my past. You'll tell from my accent uh, that I'm not from Canada. Um, well, you'll probably tell that. I am, in fact, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And in 2010, I accepted a fellowship from um, Waikato University in New Zealand. And my fellow New Zealand colleague, Alexander Barrett, and I used that um, funding to examine 25 manuscripts in New Zealand collections um, that are in an early, early, uh, early meaning for us pre-1600 of the common era, an early binding or contain parts of an early binding. One of them was this. Um, this is the front uh, leaf of Auckland Library's Sir George Gray Special Collection, Collections MSG 123. It's a Greek lectionary from the Eastern Mediterranean 12th century. Uh, the cataloger of New Zealand's medieval manuscripts, of which there are about 150, describes its binding as um, ala greca, ala greca, meaning um, in that sense, and there are experts on ala greca here, so I'll be very brief so I don't get it, don't say too much to get it wrong, um, meaning an early modern Italian, usually, imitation of Byzantine or Greek style bindings. Um, in fact, um, uh, and, and this, is the, this is the binding that he described as ala greca. In fact, uh, the reason that he described it in that way was because the book had this overcover that he was not, that the, the Professor de Hamel was not able to take off. So all he could see was these rather crude Greek style end bands. We got to take the cover off about 15 years later. Um, there it is, off. Um, and we got to see the boards that were attached um, to this book, we believe on two different occasions in the Middle Ages, following a typically Eastern Mediterranean or Byzantine system. The lower board was attached with a zigzag hinge, a set of five holes that um, must have matched the position of the sewing, was drilled in the board in parallel with the spine edge. Another set of holes was drilled closer to the edge at a slightly oblique angle. The sewing thread was then threaded in channels dug in the outer face of the board between the holes in a zigzag pattern. The entry of the sewing thread into the upper board has been entirely obscured by the backing leather that you can see here. We couldn't take that off, but we assume it too is similar, of Byzantine, similar to Byzantine Eastern Mediterranean bindings. That is, we assume that um, five holes were drilled, I should say, of the late medieval and early modern period. Um, so uh, we have not tried to date this book. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but, um, but you know, if you if you were forcing me to, I'd say some of the material in it is from the 12th century. But um, but many of many aspects of it probably date as late as the um, 17th or 18th. Um, so we assume that five holes were drilled in the boards and that the sewing was attached to these boards by simple hinging loops. Um, the method of attachment is that attachment is thus different for the upper than the lower cover, and you can see the two different systems indicated um, here, uh, in this case suggesting reuse of the boards at a different time. These differences um, is one of the, the difference between the attachment of the upper and lower board is one of the things that distinguishes Byzantine, Eastern Mediterranean, Greek and even Islamic book bindings from Carolingian and Gothic European book binding, where the pattern of the attachment of upper low, and lower boards is, is typically identical. So I've suggested that these sorts of details of how a book is tied up, make the book itself a kind of textile technology. But this book was also one of my earliest encounters with the textiles that we find in and on non-Western manuscripts, which will be the subject of the workshop today, because adhered to its boards, whether it were and still are, the remains of a blue, of blue textile, likely a lining that was um, under a now lost um, leather cover. Blue cloth linings of this sort are um, distinctive of certain groupings of Byzantine bindings. Um, though the linings themselves are usually quite coarse, whereas this one, 
um, is perhaps a relatively fine silk damask or jacquard. And, and Dr. Barrett and I decided this must be a later edition. Now, if you can hear some muddle in what I'm saying, and, and when you hear that, perhaps, um, and when I admit that I really relied on Dr. Barrett, um, who at least can knit and sew and knows something about textiles back in 2010 when we made these judgments. Um, this is, all of that indicates that this is about where we stopped. Um, we wrote out what we were able to say about the book, um, but we both realized um, that we were at the limits of what we knew um, and we should um, put the information out in the hope that someone who actually knows about Eastern Mediterranean bindings and textiles found in manuscripts might pick things up um, and, and see this interesting book and explain things we didn't understand about it. We were, that is, in 2010, working within a disciplinary silo, as was Christopher de Hamel. Um, his ex expertise, like ours, was mostly Western European books, not books like this. One way to think about what we're doing today and tomorrow is that it forms part of an answer to um, our desire in the Book in the Silk Bridge project to build a network that takes us outside of those silos to do research in intellectual spaces which crosses borders and boundaries, both now and in the past. And it's a desire shared by the PIs of the project and also so many of our staff and collaborators. And I wanna to point to the fact that Dr. Morton, um, Dr. Morton's background is the Iowa Center for the book, which is one model for this kind of transnational or global study of the book. They do a lot of it there. Many of you are, are either affiliated with or have certainly worked in relation to um, the group in the um, Center of the Study of Manuscript Cultures in Hamburg, which is another template for what we're seeking to do here. We believe that um, projects that are in Hamburg and our project too, um, suggest and try to address the need for a diverse network to study the book in its diversity, to study um, through the book, the past, shared human history, and the way that that history is determined by place and by human interactions with the non-human world and all the materials it provides to us and, sustain, and we use to sustain ourselves. I know I've succeeded in, uh, I don't think I've succeeded in explaining this book in front of you very well, but I have succeeded in making it possible for me to explain it better in the future because thanks to the Book in the Silk Roads project, I had an excuse to do what I thought I really needed to do to understand this book. And that was to meet Giorgio Budalis, who is gonna be speaking next. And, um, and I knew would be able to answer some of the questions I had about this object. Um, I actually sadly have to wait for the end of the pandemic, the, the full end of the pandemic, before I can do what I promised him and take him to Auckland, New Zealand, where he can look at this book. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for New Zealand, uh, right now they have the strictest quarantine of anywhere in the world. But in the meantime, um, what a treat for me, 11 years after wondering how I could learn more about books like this and books from further afield, including about its textile cover, not to have to pretend to expertise I lack, nor to stop asking the questions that interest me, um, but instead to be privileged as I am today, to be in the company of experts and able to connect with them uh, and work with them. One last point builds on those I've already made. As we come together to tell stories like those we'll hear today, what we're not doing is retelling the usual story about the history of the book. Um, we've all encountered this usual story in one form or another, um, even those of us who don't live in the West, it's a very Western story. Um, but, but we still get to hear it. Um, it is simple and triumphalist. It is a story of technological and societal progress from the tablet and scroll to the biblical codex of late antiquity to the early modern printing press of the Gutenberg Bible to today's digital age driven out of Silicon Valley. Each technological change ushering a new way of thinking. It's a way of thinking about the history of books and communications that has tremendous currency, thanks in part to the work of a more famous professor from Toronto, Marshall McLuhan, who in the 1960s offered statements like, um, like the one he, he gave uh, to Playboy magazine in 1969, where he said that the advent of printing in the West was, quote, directly responsible for the rise of such disparate phenomena as nationalism, the Reformation, the assembly line and its offspring, the industrial revolution, the whole concept of causality, Cartesian and Newtonian concepts of the universe, perspective and art, narrative chronology and literature and a psychological mode of introspection or inner direction that all this could be put down to what Gutenberg did when he brought printing to Western Europe. Back in the 1990s, I've been talking a lot about my career, um, uh, but this makes me think about it. I had various classes that covered this usual story of the book and it was these 
as well as discoveries about what books might tell me about literary form and literary history in Chaucer that I think oriented me towards old books. I remember right from the start objecting to this narrative of an overwhelming technological revolution through printing in the West. My objection was that of a student of medieval literatures and cultures and, um, and the manuscripts that transmitted those literatures and cultures. Um, I could see that this alternative narrative, this usual narrative about the Gutenberg period ignored or erased thousands of years of bookish history, all that came before printing, but also all that was happening outside of the West before and after the advent of printing in the West. I remember distinctly thinking about this writing home from a class one day, the whole thing was also just plainly illogical. If printing, which is just a way of making books, of facilitating reading and learning, among many others, if it was so specifically transformational, if it brought about the conditions of Western modernity directly, why was only Western civilization so transformed and transformed in this particular way by printing? I know that you know that Gutenberg's Bible was not the first book printed using, um, oh, that was a close up of the textile that I forgot to show you, uh, using movable type. Um, this uh, Buddhist teaching from Korea, the Jikshi Sinche um, Yojo, was printed in 1377 using movable type, 75 years before Gutenberg set up shop. And lying behind this movable type were, of course, hundreds of years of other East Asian block print and print traditions. Um, and this is the famous printed Diamond Sutra dated to 868 from the library, library cave at Dunhuang, the first dated printed book. The version of book history I was offered in classes at graduate school um, is specifically in an English department, I should note, but still, is a familiar one, but it's one that denigrates, ignores, or erases those cultural traditions of history keeping and bookmaking, which do not support its narrative. And it's a narrative that really acknowledges its own foundation in colonial and imperial violence. Consider the screenfold books of Mesoamerica. For example, that's the Codice Maya de Mexico, one of only four pre-Columbian Mayan codices known to have survived the colonial era, and the only one still in Mexico. The other three were carried back to Europe with other New World bounty, and many of the rest were destroyed. And actions like the book burning that Diego de Landa describes in the Yucatan in 1562, and I'll quote him, we found a large number of books in these characters. And as they contained nothing that were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them much affliction. The Western centric narrative of book history upholds the supremacy of writing over orality, of phonetic alphabets over other forms of writing, of Christianity over other religions, of European languages over other languages, as it associates Gutenberg's print culture with modernity in human civilizations and then studies it rather obsessively. This narrative in the West leaves many lost books, books that were stolen or destroyed in the service of Western imperialism and colonization, books that have been displaced from the community's best place to understand and appreciate them. I could not have articulated all of that early in my career. Um, I certainly couldn't have taken on the idea of, a, of a, the need for a new narrative of book history based on the non-Western and non-printed book as a research topic. Um, I, I didn't have the linguistic skills and please don't ask me to sew. I could never have been a conservator or curator. I lack both the coordination and the, paint and the patience. And yet that partly embodied knowledge of how books are really put together is vital to the study of the handcraft of books of history. What I eventually realized I could offer was and is, and I do this along with, uh, you know, I cannot do this alone, a strong sense of the, I, I do it with a team, a strong sense of the importance of this work and the willingness to do all I can as an organizer and administrator to support it by bringing people together to share the knowledge needed to tell a new story about the book and with it, a new story about our shared human history. The position that we take in the book in the Silk Roads Project, here's our website, it's my last slide, is that to uncover their meanings, to read their diverse texts and scripts alongside their materials, physical structures, and layers of accretions, we need to marshal innovative interdisciplinary approaches and collaborative methods um, to study books, as well as a global perspective. No single scholar or expert can produce a history of the book that can replace a, that dominant Eurocentric one. The approach must be collaborative. It has to combine expertise in diverse histories and linguistic, cultural, and religious traditions. It can be vitally enhanced by new technologies and sciences, 
because they offer new ways of encountering the knowledge about the world that is contained within books. And so it is with very great pleasure that I welcome you to an event where we get to do all those things today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. That was terrific. Uh, way to start off these two days.